I think is good for us to start with. What is God's purpose for humanity? And simply put, we are to share in Christ's humanity. Our humanity joined with Christ uh, to finally share in the eternal love and life of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we have come to understand. That is, uh, in one sense, you know, the crux of what we exist for, why, why we were created. So we are to share in Christ's humanity so that we can share in the love and life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It is a never-ending life of worship. You remember we discussed about worship last time, and worship is not just singing songs. Uh, worship is uh, a dynamic relationship with God. It is, uh, in a very small way, pictured in what we do on a Sunday or what we do on a daily basis, but it's a dynamic relationship with God, you know, or every single moment of our life, of our existence. And so you could say that the very, the, the purpose for, for uh, humanity to exist is to have a relationship with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's why we are made relational. We as human beings are made to be relational. That is a very important aspect of our uh, our makeup, and we will discuss that as we go along. Now, how, how is this accomplished? What, how is the whole relational uh, goal accomplished? And that is, we as human beings today have to live by the faith that Jesus gives to us. Uh, we are able to accomplish and achieve the very purpose for our lives by the faith that Jesus gives. Uh, it is a faith that Jesus shares with us because he was human and he lived by that faith in his Father. And our faith includes that we are going to be justified, sanctified, and glorified by the person of Jesus. And that's the reason why last time we specifically said that the person of Jesus makes our faith, our religion, our relationship with God unique. You know, it is a person that makes our relationship with God unique. It is not necessarily the kind of laws we have or the, uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, regulations we have or uh, it is the person of Jesus that becomes most important. Some of you as senior members would remember, you know, Mr. Herbert Armstrong used to say that uh, we, that Christianity preaches the person of Jesus, but does not preach the message of Jesus. I think some of you might remember that. I am not sure, but uh, actually, uh, you know, that was incomplete. Uh, to preach the message of Jesus by discarding or by separating the person of Jesus is not possible. Because the message is the person. Uh, we cannot have the message without the person. So you cannot say that the message is more important than the person. The message and the person is the same. So we cannot preach Christianity without the person of Jesus. And that is uh, something very important for the doctrine of humanity. Because the person of Jesus in his humanity is what makes, makes us, you know, uh, unique and important for God. And our purpose is all tied up in the humanity and the person of Jesus. We also discussed last time that any attempt to justify ourselves, you know, uh, justification coming out of our works or what we do is actually idolatry. It is worshipping the self. And that's one of the modern forms of idolatry. And that's why we do not preach 
uh, salvation through works. Uh, it is salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and the works of Jesus. We have to be careful that we don't think that we can justify and sanctify ourselves by our works. So that can sometimes turn out to be idolatry. And we should not, never forget that we live in the communion of the Spirit today. Jesus, in his humanity, has accomplished the work of reconciliation. But today it is through the communion of the Spirit that we are united with Jesus, with his humanity. And so the communion of the Spirit today is very important. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So as human beings, we cannot ignore the, the ministry and the communion of the Holy Spirit that makes us uh, be united with Jesus. And as we are more and more united with Jesus, we conform to his image, the image of Christ. And there we have another very important aspect of this, human, of this doctrine. The doctrine of humanity finally is to conform to the image of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the perfect image of God. Talking about image, last time we then discussed about God's image. Uh, interestingly enough, humanity, human beings, male and female are created in the image of God, right? Uh, and the discussion with regards to the image of God, of course, is a very, very deep one. And there are many aspects to that. And uh, we are going to dwell a, a little bit today on that. But let's just remember that humanity is the only creation uh, that was created in the image of God. Right? And... What is this image of God, right? Now, I alluded to that a little earlier, that finally the image of God is Jesus Christ, the perfect image of God, and we are conforming to that image. But let's just go back and look at it uh, from a basic perspective, and that is we as created in the image of God are distinct from all other creation, including the animal kingdom. You have the flora and the fauna, uh, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom. Uh, you have all, all other kinds of uh, creation. But we are distinct from that. Uh, we are the only creation, part of God's creation, that mm -hmm. have the ability to reason, to think, to imagine, to make decisions. We have the freedom to experience love and to, to accept love and to give love. Uh, so humanity has the ability to decide through reason and the ability to think. Um, and so God's image is inclusive of all of this. Now, we will, like I said, we will come to it, but let's now quickly go on to reading from the booklet. And today we are going to read uh, question six in the section uh, of section six, which is humanity. We are going to read question six. So we will finish these three questions, remaining three questions, and then we will make some comments on uh, uh, this doctrine. I'm going to read the question now, uh, which is, what does our creation in God's image reflect about God's love for us? <laughs> and the answer reads, out of his love, God created us for eternal fellowship and communion with himself. When we live wholeheartedly for God, we honor our creator as the source of all good things. We also honor God by loving others as God loves them. We were created to live like Jesus, who obeys the two great commandments, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others in a way that reflects how God loves us. So 
the question is asking uh, now that we are created in the image of God, how does it reflect God's love for us? Uh, how is God loving us? Because God is love and he created us in his love and for his love. And that brings us to that very important point that in the first line it says, God created us for eternal fellowship and communion with himself. So we come back to the very purpose of uh, why we were created. Interesting, isn't it? God created us so that he could actually share himself with us. As Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he's created us so that he can actually share his person, himself with us. Of course, uh, the person of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that human beings enjoy this whole aspect of sharing? Uh, we live lives in a way where we share. For example, we like to spend time with one another. We like to fellowship. You know, on many occasions, we come together and share a meal. Uh, and we fellowship over a meal. Many a times we invite people to our homes where they stay with us. And there is this tremendous uh, affinity that human beings have of this, uh, of wanting to share. We share ourselves, we share our homes, we share our meals, our resources. And that I think uh, in, a, in, a very, in, 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 a, in a very small way shows us how God is going to accomplish his purpose for us. He is going to share himself with us. And uh, just to read John, uh, I mean to say what Jesus says about this, I'd like to go to John chapter 17, the gospel of John. Just read a few verses from uh, this prayer that Jesus makes to God. And very powerful prayer. And it has so much of theology in that prayer. If you sit down to analyze each of those sentences, it, has, it is very profound. But let me just read a few verses in John 17. We'll begin in verse 20. Let's read it from this perspective of how God is sharing himself with us. And Jesus has come for that express purpose in his humanity to accomplish a reconciliation where we can finally share, you know, our lives with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 20, it says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So God is, uh, Jesus is including all of us who will come to believe in him. Verse 21 says that all of them may be one. And how is this one? Or what kind of oneness? He says that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So he is explaining how that oneness manifests itself. It is the similar oneness that even as father and son enjoy. They continue, it continues to say in verse 21, may they also believe, uh, be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So once again, he's you know, the purpose is inviting us into himself. Verse 22 says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. So notice how constantly there is an emphasis, there is a reference to a sharing life, a shared life. Oneness is a shared life, right? Verse 23, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Unit, what is unity? Once again, the whole concept of sharing comes there. And what is the sharing? The sharing and the unity is between God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and with us. And so you can see the whole purpose of God creating humanity being played out in these verses. Completing in uh, verse 23, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Interesting, isn't it? The world will know. In other words, this is the purpose. This is the purpose that the world needs to know, that you sent me 
and have loved them even as you loved me. So the whole aspect of sharing comes and is the very purpose. Let's just complete up to verse 26. In verse 24 it reads, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. And that very verse packs in a lot of theology, but I just want to focus on the fact that, notice, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Jesus is willing to share his, you could say, uh, you know, where he is. He's, sh he's sharing his position, his location, but it is much more than location. You know, I mean, it, it, it is, goes beyond the physical. So it, there is a sharing that is so very intimate with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then we complete in verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. Okay, let's finish in verse 26. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. If you read those verses from this perspective of how God has such a passion of wanting to share himself with us, share what he is and his love, uh, you can begin to see the very purpose of uh, God being played out in those verses. And so uh, we can conclude those that particular section by just mentioning that the very purpose of hum the human life is uh, so that we can share in God's love. God is love. He never stops being love. He is constantly loving us and manifesting that love in so many different ways. And what God and what Jesus is helping us understand through those verses is that we can be happy. We can have a sense of fulfillment. We can have a sense of purpose and meaning only in God's love. If we separate ourselves from God's love, we have lost the very purpose of life. See? Uh, because the opposite of love is, is destruction, is darkness. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the scripture indicates that some will tend to love darkness more than light, which Jesus, which Jesus is. So, uh, so Jesus is, you know, gathering us up into his humanity so that we might enjoy his love, himself, and have a shared life, you know, in the, uh, which is the ultimate purpose. Okay, let's move to the seventh question. It's over on the next page if you have a book. And uh, this is the question. 6.7, it's also on your screen. And the question reads, was God's image lost when humankind turned from God by falling into sin? And the answer is yes and no. Because of sin, our relation, relations with God and his creation became distorted and confused. Although we did not cease to be, uh, did not cease to be with God, our fellow human beings and other creatures, we did cease to be for them. There is an important distinction there. We'll come back to that. It continues, although we did not lose our distinctive human capacities completely, we did lose our ability to use them rightly, especially in relation to God. Having ruined our connection with God by distrusting and then disobeying God's will, we are persons with hearts curved in upon ourselves. Okay? That's an interesting expression. We'll uh, look at that uh, in just a moment. Let's finish uh, reading verse, uh, the answer in, verse, uh, in, in, in the seventh one. Having become enslaved to sin, we are unable to free ourselves. Though some freedom remains for us as sinners, our freedom is exercised only within the bounds 
of sin and is always exposed to the power of sin, which looks to take advantage of the weakness of human nature. So the question once again is, what happened to the image? We were created in the image of God. What happened to that image? And I think what is basically being said is that image was damaged, but not lost. Okay. So in other words, the purpose for humanity still remains. The purpose has not been altered, but the image of God with which we can enjoy the purpose of our existence was like it says, it was distorted and confused. Okay, So we did not lose the image, but it was very badly, severely damaged. And we can see the result of how human beings live today uh, because of the damage we have of that image. The faculties we have of reason, thinking, freedom to choose, uh, you know, has now been distorted so much that these are being used for destruction rather than for, you know, uh, salvation and for, for construction, you could say. Notice it says, we, though we did not see, uh, cease to be with God, right? Uh, we did cease to be for them. In other words, we, we, we began to be, go against God. Uh, and because we're going against God, we're go, going against other human beings. And not only other human beings, we're also going against the created order. We are going against the environment. And I think that is so clearly seen today. So uh, the image we have in us is uh, pushing us against each other rather than being for each other. So in our distortion, we think that we must be for ourselves. We cannot trust others. We cannot live by accommodating others. We want to compete. We, we live in competition. We live with a sense of... Uh, you know, uh, constant, uh, what do you say, distrust and mistrust of others. And that is what the phrase which says, we are persons with hearts curved in upon ourselves. It's from the Latin, uh, and I forgot to, meant exact, to see exactly what the Latin says, but we are curved in upon ourselves. In other words, we have become self-centered. Uh, and that the, is the effect of sin. Uh, we stop being other-centered. We stop caring for others. Even though we have a desire to care, but we exercise it by, self, by being selfish. Even sometimes our desire to help others is out of a selfish motive. And that is the unfortunate result of sin residing in us. It is constantly uh, you know, influencing us to be protective of ourselves. We do not become vulnerable to others. We are always trying to be prote protective of ourselves. So this is what has happened to the image uh, that uh, we were created in. The image was damaged. It was not lost. So thankfully, God's purpose was not thwarted. When we sinned and when we became selfish and when we went against God and others, uh, the purpose of God was not defeated. The purpose was not, the purpose of God was not frustrated. He was going to pursue that purpose. And of course, now we know uh, in Jesus, that purpose was going to be fulfilled. Okay. I noticed uh, half an hour has gone by. We will read one more. And we'll finish this uh, reading and then we'll come back to uh, some discussion. So I'm going to read now the last question, which is 6.8. 6 stands for the section and 8 stands for the question. The question reads, how does Jesus restore us to the, uh, the, the image of God? We just discussed how the image of God has been uh, distorted and confused in us. How does Jesus restore us to us the image of God? And the answer 
is as follows. Though humankind turned from God by falling into sin, God did not turn from us. Instead, he sent Jesus to restore our broken humanity. In living completely for God, Jesus gave himself completely for us, even to the point of dying on our behalf. In doing so, he perfectly fulfilled the two great commands, commandments on our behalf, loving God with all his and all he has and loving all people in a way that reflects how the father loves him. By living so completely for others in the name of the father, Jesus manifested what he was. Uh, the perfect image of God in union with Christ by the spirit, we all of humanity by grace became become conformed to Christ through faith. We discussed that a little earlier. Let me finish. In communion with Christ, we share by the Holy Spirit in his regenerated human nature. In fellowship with our risen Lord, our humanity is renewed in such a way that the image of God that was lost in Adam is restored in us. All right. I think... Uh, most of it should be self-evident, but let's just pick up a few thoughts from there. Uh, one thing is so, you know, hopeful for us that we have a God who did not turn from us, even though we turned from him. We went against him, but God did not abandon us. He did not turn from us. Okay, so that is something which... Uh, we continue to remain hopeful. And why? Because God is love. And that is the God we worship. A God who comes to pursue us in spite of the fact that we continue to run away from him. He is constantly making himself available to us. Now, it also says, in Jesus, uh, he sent Jesus. And in Jesus, uh, through his incarnation his life on the earth through his death and resurrection and of course the ascension jesus accomplished to restore the image and that is the crux of the point uh, jesus in his humanity is restoring to us that perfect image that he himself has how did he do that fulfilling the well you could say the covenant of the law and uh and then inviting us into his humanity so we can enjoy that obedience we can enjoy that righteousness something very important and i think we uh, have struggled with this and some time back i was talking to someone and they continue to find a problem with uh, you know difficulty with this particular thing jesus came to fulfill the law he did not come to destroy the law see and that is uh, something that uh, we have struggled with. Uh, uh, you know, many a times we think that, oh, since he has not come to destroy the law, and if you go back to Matthew, you know, chapter 5, he discusses that. Uh, we feel we must keep the law. And the question is, which law? And we, we, we think that it's the Ten Commandments, the tithing law, the, you know, the food laws, and the, all the other, you know, Sabbath, Sabbath laws. But that is not what was meant when Jesus came to fulfill the law. So remember, he did not destroy it, he fulfilled it. Uh, so we are not saying that, you know, Jesus, uh, like a smart aleck, you know, person came to destroy God's law. No, that is not what we are saying. He came to fulfill it. Maybe we can have a discussion on that sometime down the line. Okay. Um, just uh, another thought, in communion with Christ, it says, we share by the Holy Spirit in his regenerated human nature. So communion with Christ in the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit is very important. So in other words, we have to exercise our image, though it is damaged, to decide to be in union with Christ. God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit will not force that union with us. So we have a responsibility to have communion with Christ. Uh, uh, only in that union we have salvation. We have safety. 
only in that union we have regeneration, we have redemption, uh, we have reconciliation. We cannot do it on our own, apart from Christ. We have to be in union with Christ. That is why we say salvation is only in Christ. Right? We are not being arrogant by saying that. We are saying it because Christ in his humanity accomplished what we in our humanity cannot. And so there is, an, there is a reason we have to exercise, even though our damaged image, a damaged thinking process, we have to realize that we have to be in union with Christ. We have to allow the Holy Spirit now to work the regeneration in us the changing of the human nature in us so that we can allow the fruit of the Holy Spirit to be manifest in us. And so finally, uh, the image that of God that was lost in Adam, he restored in us through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the reason why Jesus became the second Adam. It makes so much sense when we look at it from that perspective and what the Apostle tells us. Jesus became the second Adam so that we can have in him have eternal life. In the first Adam, we have death and destruction because of uh, the, you know, the break or the damage of the image. But in Jesus, that image is restored and we have eternal life in Christ our Lord and he becomes then the second Adam. Okay, having said that, just a few thoughts, uh, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. So, doctrine of humanity. Uh, when we look at it from this Trinitarian perspective, I think we begin to see so much more than we could ever see before. Uh, remember, in the scientific world, we are called Homo sapiens. <laughs> and Homo sapiens is used for uh, the animal kingdom. And many atheists and those who have no faith uh, or, or don't belong to the faith think and believe that we are homo sapiens belonging to the animal kingdom. Now, in one sense, that is true. Uh, we are of the earth. We were created from the dust of the ground. And we have some things in common with the animal kingdom. But we are not animals. Uh, we are unique in that creation. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Uh, we are, uh, we are more, we have, we are moral beings. We are created in the image of God. That image of God makes us moral beings or gives us a moral capacity to do things and to decide and to think and to reason and to manifest that morality in certain ways. And where is it exercised most? The, the morality we have because of the image of God is exercised in relationship. More than anything else, it's exercised in relationship. And so we belong to a very special class in the creation. We are not just pure homo sapiens like the scientists describe or the biologists describe us. We may have a homo sapien affiliation, but we are also have a spiritual component in us. And that is the image of God, the residence of the Holy Spirit, conforming us to the image of the Son, which is, of course, the perfect image of God. Uh, let me finally then read one verse and then we will discuss. I want to just go to... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, and read verse, uh, let me see, maybe 48, 49, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 48 says, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so are also those who are of heaven. I think you can see the distinction there. That is the first Adam and the second Adam. And then verse 49, 
and just as we have borne the image of the earthly man so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man and i think you are very clear there once again the first adam and the second adam is being described right and in verse 50 this is the fantastic hope that we have i declare to you brothers and sisters that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does the perish- perishable inherit the imperishable and then of course you know that whole wonderful mystery uh, of the resurrection where the perishable will put on you know immortality imperishable okay why is that possible because now we are belong to the second adam uh we are no more uh you know uh sort of part of the first adam because of christ we belong to the second adam and we have the hope of eternal life and once again it is possible only in christ because he is the only one as far as i know who was heavenly who participated in the earthly and lifted us up to enjoy those heavenly realities which is our finally and of course the father son holy spirit the relational dynamics that exist between father son holy spirit so that is in one sense a, a very powerful doctrine of the of our humanity uh, let's now open it up for some thoughts and questions let's see okay uh, just trying to get the grid back yes okay gallery here here we are okay let's uh, any thoughts or comments that you'd like to make uh, with what we've discussed so far that was the doctrine of humanity good to see you franklin i'm glad you could join us. right and of course uh, anand and joshua are also joining us bertram lovely to see you too <laughs> oh is uh, anand trying to ask a question yes yes anand we can't hear you uh, could you point seven maybe the two devices may be causing some problem i'm not sure Okay. You want to go ahead with your question on Daddy it's coming it's coming we need to put the sound Hello Yes Anand go ahead Then did we really lose the image of God Uh Adam said you are asking the question did we lose the image of god was it lost from humanity when adam came? no 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 we we have not lost but our the image was damaged or distorted that is the language we use we are not saying we lost it completely uh we are saying that it was damaged that is the reason why we are so confused and we have become selfish and think that a selfish way of living gives us happiness which it doesn't does it make sense anand yes sir because i always felt that we are made in the image of god and those qualities are in mind to be made yes we are made in the image of god and even though our image that image has been damaged uh we are still able to think and reason choose um, uh we have the ability to make decisions uh and we are 
we have the capacity to enter into relationships all of that is you know a a complex part of the image but those are used in a way where unfortunately uh sometimes it results in destruction and frustration and that is where the problem is any other, anybody else can like to just uh add in to the thought i just feel uh, uh we don't need to even use the language image has been damaged also what i feel is we are created in the image of god and we had the image of god but unfortunately we uh, our minds have been changed our vision has been changed due to the sin <laughs> and we were not able to live up to who we are in other words we forgot to live like who we are we that's what we, we our minds have been corrupted that's why jesus comes and says repent change your mind he is not uh, changing ourselves and that scripture doesn't say we are being we are we are going to bring back to the image of god we are being confirmed to the image of god how scripture says in second second corinthians 3:18 that continuous renewal of mind our mind has been corrupted not the image basically we are in the same image but our mind has been corrupted because of that we are not living according to our the way we are created so jesus came and through his cross he changed everything till jesus come nobody knows to uh, forgive our brothers in fact i could say that if you read the history of the history in the bible we don't know to forgive our brother and jesus comes and says oh, we can forgive our brother and uh, we can love our enemies that is the image that we truly have but we are living in a, we are living uh, in a mental illusion that's why pharisees and all could not take it the uh, peter could not take it how many times should i forgive my brethren he could not understand that jesus comes and tells forever you have to forgive so it is already in us but we are living in a mental illusion so jesus comes and says repent and constantly with the scripture because of what jesus has done here he has shown truly who uh, what uh, what a human is if you want to understand who truly we are we need to look unto jesus so looking unto jesus we may constantly change our mind and uh, live according to the image that god has and god has imprinted on us that's, that's just a thought but you had a thought uh, unmute yourself before speaking you need to un unmute bertie can you hear me yes go ahead yeah i feel this brought a very uh, important uh, uh, important uh, i mean explained it quite well that uh, uh, and of course uh, you know adding to you what you said it's not fully lost but damaged and in what sense our minds are corrupted and other things i would like to mention that even our heart god gives a lot of importance to the heart god says in the word of god that uh, the heart is deceitful above all than desperately wicked so christ came heal the heart heal the heart as well uh, which is the seat uh, you know a, a seat where god christ will dwell and where uh, uh, the image a transformational change of uh, of uh, this thing the the this thing the what is accomplished for us salvation is accomplished for us and the whole process of change is not only in the mind because people can academically uh, you know say there is a god and we should believe god and serve god uh, basically our heart should be right with god and uh, as you know god has done that in christ and uh, god is coming to uh, be in us in christ and uh, the holy spirit is continually continually washing us through the word of god conforming us more and more to christ and uh, restoring us to the image of god which god has willed and purposed and uh, has been seen in the person of jesus christ who came in the flesh and blood and uh, loved us loved god loved us and uh, died for our sins rose and ascended and is the true image of god and true uh, spiritual humanity my point is besides the mind 
even the heart should be mentioned well uh, praveen while talking about the changes you know yeah the mind we feel the mind is so active we talk we think and you know reason all but what about the heart could mr sarai mention something about the heart <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you bertie for some of your thoughts sir yeah one small uh, thought i would like to add here it is um, uh, regarding praveen you want to say something go ahead uh yeah one one particular point i would like to add as we are talking about the uh, image of god most of the times the moment we talk about the image of god we feel we don't have the image of god we are uh, it's got damaged because we constantly look at the corruption in the world the kind of evil deeds that are coming up and uh, even the way we are thinking the way we are acting or we are looking what is happening around us uh but the image of god is beyond our actions the image of god is beyond our morality since the morals and ethics are being damaged we think the image of god has been distorted <coughs> i mean damaged the image of god is beyond that uh, the deepest sense everybody have like you know every uh, all of us all we humans we have a sense to get connected to somebody we want to be related we want to be in our families so that is the that is a very image of god that god has put put in us but unfortunately this corruption has taken over us what jesus taught us after coming uh, after coming to earth is to to be in family in other words in simple words if you speak love your brother it's another words make a universal family live like one family so uh, we cannot define image of god based on the a uh, corruption that is taking place in the world or immoral things or ethics uh, unethical things that are taking place in our world the image of god has been imprinted in our very core in our very core the nature itself in the depth itself it has been made and sin and all our outer uh, control out, outwardly they are controlling us but inwardly we are the same that's why god still loves us and he continues to love us he came and died for us and many places jesus also says <coughs> i mean <coughs> he call he also calls the humans created in the image of god paul calls the same thing so uh, we should not make a short steps of uh, uh, confirming or de- deciding the image of god or looking at the ethical and moral things happening around us what you wanted to make a comment yeah, as as from uh can you hear me, you hear me? Yeah, yes 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 go ahead yeah uh, praveen apin yes right says the operation as the writing team and uh, it works purpose is being fulfilled in us and uh, it's uh, wonderful that we are uh, yielded to him i would just like to uh, mention the importance of the word of god and spirit of god because proverb in one of the proverbs i can't quote the exact one it says god says my son uh, uh, turn at my reproof uh, turn yeah turn at my reproof and behold i will pour my spirit unto you and make my words known unto you so there is a lot of importance you know uh, in of returning goes the one he task the process of uh, you know, repentance and, and like god says repentance uh, you know he grants repentance in life uh, and that uh, that we should be being heed we should be paying heed to his word he uses his word he uses the holy spirit uh, so uh, it's very much part of uh, of uh, uh, the ongoing transformational uh conforming to christ and for god's purpose to be fulfilled to complete his image in us as uh, so, um, in the likeness in the likeness of jesus christ and conforming to christ it's uh, yeah it is going on in us. so we should never be my point is with uh, god says run me god takes uh bertie your uh... Bertie, you are you are muted again. <laughs> you got muted again. Hello. Okay. Thanks, Bertie. Uh, Sikandar, you had us. You had a thought to share with us. Sir, I 
i read the bible study the bible and take it to heart and understand it i am unable to express it in my prayers whenever i was asked, asked to pray in the public or yesterday i had some meeting with the church members they asked me to pray there i go back that uh, expression i lack is this because of my uh, backwardness or uh, some i understand everything but uh, in expression i lack behind uh, that is the thing uh, which i uh, i think it uh, it's a uh, drawback for me <laughs> well all i can say sekandar is that we all struggle with that <laughs> even though sometimes we have uh, you know a certain understanding and knowledge because of our reading of the scriptures uh, we we always struggle with expressing it in the best way even right now we are talking about the image of god no. you know there are various ways perhaps we could express it and because of our limited understanding and our comprehension we will not be able to sort of nail it down to the last detail bertie was saying oh. what about the heart yes sir now you know uh, some of these words are synonymous you know the mind could be interchangeably used as the heart and the heart but then there could be some distinction the mind could perhaps refer to our faculties of thinking and reasoning the heart could be more of the emotional uh, but you know sometimes to uh, become too uh, technical and uh, make too much of a distinction can sometimes you know confuse us so we have to be careful but we do know we have a problem in our thinking we have a problem in our emotional you know expressions and so uh, and all of that is connected with you know with this image that we have been discussing and talking uh, like praveen said the image is is very much there uh, but we are operating out of a complete confused distorted mind uh, and so that is what jesus perhaps clarifies he is the perfect image of god right and we are being conformed to that image and when we look at ourselves and we look at christ we can see the huge <laughs> the huge gap but christ constantly comes towards us and he's pulling us into him right the holy spirit is constantly allowing or leading us to christ and developing the image of christ in us and so perhaps we can take that as the tremendous hope that we have bertie go ahead you had a thought yeah hey sir we not get uh, the book of book can you hear me can you hear me i i i yeah we are you are slightly breaking up bertie yeah. but talk slowly and we can hear you yeah yeah no just we've been mindful of god sorry bertie we are not able to hear you i think once again you are muted uh, perhaps what you can do is you can just if you had a question submit it by whatsapp and then i will uh, we, we will already discuss it okay <laughs> thank you any other thoughts or, or comments or questions yes sir franklin go ahead sir will you be also explaining sir man is made in the likeness of god or oh, image of god likeness of god is that what you say will you be explaining this at a later stage uh, are you saying that likeness of god is different from image of god i think the bible draws a distinction no sir uh, what is the distinction you tell me franklin <laughs> no sir, i can't explain <laughs> sir i think uh, that is a parallel uh, you know it, it, they are parallel to each other in other words they basically uh, are referring to the same thing now there could be some distinction uh, you know we have not you know gone so deeply into that but yes uh, maybe we'll just check that and see if if there are any distinctions but i have not yet come across any scholars discussing that <laughs> sir sir Yes, I think, sir. Uh, one of our discussions, sir, you and Praveen explained. So the prodigal son, no, sir. Yes. The prodigal son, when he left his father home and went away, 
uh, his image was intact he lost his likeness he was he was still the uh, son of the father he has not lost his relationship but his character took a battering are you saying that we said it yes sir i remember sir i think you are praveen uh, yeah, perhaps okay. we were discussing about image and likeness but i don't remember we were discussing that in uh, connection with the prodigal son but if, uh, regarding the likeness you have spoken about definitely there are differences between uh, image and uh, likeness uh, the word demut has been used uh, for likeness actually if you read genesis moses particularly uses the word likeness uh, is because uh, he as he is explaining about the creation order uh, uh, after every creature he adds the word saying like Uh, god created animals according to their own kind god created birds according to their own kind god, god created uh, trees and plants according to their own kind this is the word repeatedly comes when it comes to man the word kind is not used according to their own kind because in uh, cats family there are so many kinds of cats tigers are there all these kinds of things come according in cats family they are of same kind in birds there are kind same kind of things in fishes there are same kind of things but when it comes to humans there is no other creature we are we to say that god created humans of their own kind there is nothing like this humans are a unique creation and what is the kind of humans it is the, the in order to explain that he used the word likeness god created us in his own likeness the mean the reason the importance of the word likeness is this you know uh, for example a dog will mate with a same kind of dog will marry same kind of thing a bird with the same thing they don't usually they don't interchange now we are hybrid doing hybrid and all but usually they don't interchange they go with the, to their own kind to Uh, to multiply and to grow in other words to take it in a better language a a a particular creature goes to its own kind to have a fellowship to have a relationship and to grow but for us we are in the likeness of god which tells us we are created to get connected to god to be in relationship with god and fellowship with god and god is able to love us and give us love and receive love and in the same capacity he has created us to receive love and to give love what god is able to do in relationship that we he enabled us by making us in his image so that we could do it in our own family what god is doing among the trinity we could do it in the marriage and in the family that's how he enabled us that is being in likeness of god and we can get connected to god so the we belong to the kind of god animals belongs to their own kind in order to explain that moses used the word uh, uh, likeness actually does it does it help uh just to make a clarification uh remember we we uh, we used to discuss this over armstrong used to talk about it uh and he concluded that we will become god because we are in the likeness of god uh so we have to be careful that we don't uh, conclude and in fact there are a lot of uh, theologies today uh that come from the word of faith movement and the pros- the health wealth prosperity gospel they all tend to use this to say that we will become god and i think the mormons also talk about mormons. it that we are becoming god so we have to be careful that we uh don't mistake the likeness or the image of god to think that we will be god uh no we are not god we are still we will be glorified humans like jesus christ is today but we will never be god because we always uh, had a beginning but just to make that clarification yeah the word likeness is more about kind it is to relate we are able to relate to god that that's where the that main yeah good i think uh, some interesting thoughts there Okay I think the time is up. <laughs> uh thank you for joining again and uh, uh feel free if you have any comments or even a question feel free to whatsapp uh us and we can always continue the discussion. Remember this is a forum for us to help you uh 
uh, you know, become a little bit more familiar with some of these theological thoughts and the Bible studies so that we can go deep. So feel free to connect and uh, ask questions. But thank you very much for your contributions. Once um, more, the name yeah. of the book, sir, which you are following now? Uh, uh, that is We Believe Uncle. I, I will send an email, uh, WhatsApp to you. I'll send it okay. in WhatsApp to you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then uh, it was a lovely time together. Uh, may I request uh, Franklin to close in prayer? Please unmute yourself, Franklin. Unmute yourself. Franklin, we can't hear you. So can you hear me, sir? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Gracious Lord, our loving Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and this time to look into your word, Lord, and to learn more of you. Lord, thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity and privilege. Thank you, Lord, for all of us who are able to attend. Lord, we ask, Father, that you will open our hearts and our minds to an understanding of your word. Because, Lord, in the ultimate analysis, flesh and blood cannot understand. Lord, spiritual understanding is something that you need to impart Lord, we ask that you will help us to understand your word and, Lord, the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we ask, Father, that you will be with us, help us to study and grow as your dear children and to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. And as we pray for ourselves, Lord, we want to remember the many, many more of our members and those who are interested in learning your word. Lord, that you will help them and they too will join us in this study. Lord, do take care of all of us from this novel virus. Do continue to protect us from every danger, real and, and hidden. Bless us, Lord, till we meet on Sunday for worship. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you and have a good evening. Amen. Yeah. I send the booklet to you. In WhatsApp. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.